In May 2003, the National Human Genome Center at Howard University held a workshop in Washington, DC. The topic for the workshop and a subsequent special issue of the journal Nature Genetics in 2004 was human genome variation and race. Of specific concern for participants, according to Francis Collins, director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, were, quote, connections among race, ethnicity, genetics, and health. Referencing the special issue a year later in an opinion piece written for the New York Times, Armand Marie Lerroy, an evolutionary developmental biologist at Imperial College London, made clear that something of a sea change was underway in research on human racial variation. What had once been seen as orthodoxy, that race was a biologically meaningless category because the variation within any one putative race was larger than that between any two races, was coming under question. Previously depicted as a fictive social co construct as an, quote, indication of the power of socioeconomically based ideology by the well-known geneticist Richard Lewontin, the idea of race was, according to Larrois, acquiring a new reality. As with the researchers at Howard, Larrois draw particular attention to the utility of racial categorization in studies of health and medicine. Different races, he claimed, are prone to different diseases and some drugs appear to exhibit racially varying actions. Now, many scholars, myself included, have questioned both Lerroy's premises and his conclusions, but there's no denying the fact that his claims have proved prescient. Arguments concerning the racial specificity of both diseases and treatments have rapidly expanded in number in the last decade, uh, the New York Times publishes an op-ed on this topic about every few years, um, with the latest, uh, which just came out uh, a month ago or two, uh, with the latest inspiring yet another string of critiques from historians and sociologists of medicine and biology. Yet, it would be wrong to see contemporary claims connecting medicine and race as novel developments although that is the claim often made by the people making this argument, that they're new and therefore they're rocking the boat on an orthodoxy. So pushing back in the way that historians do about whether things are in fact new has real importance in this debate. So such connections are, of course, of very long standing. One of the oldest lengthy tracts on human physical variation we possess is a work attributed to the fourth century BC physician Hippocrates. In Airs, Waters and Places, Hippocrates argued that the elements of his title, which vary from region to region, produce different kinds of people with characteristically different medical afflictions. Those who lived in cities exposed to cold winds, us, were well braced and slender, while those accustomed to warm winds were flabby. The former suffered typically from pleurisies and suppurations in the lungs, while the latter were prone to dysentery and chronic winter fevers. Such Hippocratic understandings of the relationships between peoples, places, and illnesses would remain common well into the 19th century. But before getting into this, we should be explicit about meanings and definitions. What do I mean when I use the term race? Today, the word is used in at least two different contexts. Uh, students in my undergraduate classes tend to regard both the statements that Indo-Australians eat disgusting food and have no table manners, and Indo-Australians possess smaller brains and hence as less intelligent. They perceive both as racist, although of course, while well, both are offensive and untrue, um, they aren't necessarily speaking about the same thing. The former might better be termed something like ethnic bigotry, cultural racism for some, while the latter is more accurately described as racist in the sense that it involves claims about biological and possibly heritable traits. I have been more concerned in my own research with the latter kind of somatic differences, although I'm aware that it's sometimes difficult, both then and now, to distinguish ethnic bigotry from what could be called physical racism. Now, for many modern historians, the definition of race and racism, the reason why we care about this, uh, 
is bound up with attempts to explain the horrific genocides of the 20th century, and in particular, the Holocaust. What was the history of ideas they have asked that led to the final solution? Here, historians have pointed to three claims, that races are effectively static over long periods of time, racial fixity, that racial traits are passed on from generation to generation, so heritability, and that physical traits, so skull size or brain shape, for example, determine or at least condition moral, intellectual, and behavioral traits, so biological determinism. While one finds traces of such ideas earlier, their emergence in full form and in relation to one another may be observed force first in the late 18th and 19th centuries, which has led some scholars to argue that race itself is a product of the modern age. Others insist that one may find racist, or at least proto-racist, their term, ideas much earlier. Now, these criteria have largely emerged from studies of the history of natural historical approaches to race, what Nancy Steppen termed race science. A rather simpler and, I would argue, more general formulation emerges from work on the history not of racial anatomies, but of racial pathologies, that is to say, race medicine. What is distinctive about modern theories of race is their insistence on physical differences as a cause of other differences, whether medical, intellectual, behavioral, or other. So hence, returning to the example I used above, the idea that Indo-Australians have weaker intellects because, as a racial group, they have smaller brains. Or to take a less facetious example, the claim that it is somatic differences between African Americans and European Americans that explains the greater prevalence of sickle cell anemia in the former population. One does not find such causal claims for the most part in the classical late antique or medieval periods. Thus, one, while one finds examples of color prejudice in medieval manuscripts, where devils, for example, are depicted with black skin, the causal claim is precisely the inverse of that found in the 19th century. Where 19th century racists claimed that Africans were wicked because they were black, the logic of medieval color prejudice is largely symbolic, insisting that devils are black because they are wicked. Now, medicine provides a particularly powerful area for exploring this difference in causal argumentation. Again, Hippocrates provides a salient example, for while he does indeed discuss the physical features of peoples found in certain places, along with their characteristic diseases, cultural traits, and political orderings, he does not derive the last three from the first. That is, race is not the cause of cultural politics. Rather, all elements are supposed to be caused by climate, broadly construed, and diet. In the examples Lerroir invokes, racial differences lead to differences in disease susceptibility. Within the Hippocratic tradition, racial differences and differences in disease susceptibility are both due to the same underlying causes, airs, waters, and places. If one can then use the word race in a rather loose sense well before the 1700s, one must do so with an awareness that race began to do vastly more work as a concept and as a causal mechanism from the 18th century onwards. Now there's another, and for us perhaps more critical reason, to pay attention to the history of race medicine, particularly in the age of colonialism, beginning with the discovery of the new world by Europeans, if we would like to see race in action, we should look not to philosophical debates in the colonial metropole, but to engagements in the colonies themselves. Those who wrote naturalistic accounts of the physical characteristics of the different people they encountered outside Europe were almost all trained in medicine and brought this training to bear on their observations. And if we wish to understand relationships between the day-to-day -day practices of slavery and naturalistic knowledge, we are best served in looking at medicine and the roles that physicians, surgeons, and midwives played in the support and sometimes the critique of the slave trade. Were we to look at the end 
of the 18th and the first half of the 19th century, we would immediately note that almost all of the most prominent so-called race scientists were in fact trained in medicine. In Britain, for example, James Cowles Pritchard was a Bristol physician, while Robert Knox, author of the infamous text, The Races of Men from 1850, was an anatomist who left Edinburgh several years after his involvement in the Burke and Hare body snatching scandal. From the 1860s to the 1940s, both the eugenics and racial hygiene movements were quite explicitly modeled on programs for public health. The close involvement of doctors with Nazi social policy and medical experimentation became clear to the world when a number were convicted and executed after the Nuremberg trials. There is thus a long history behind the fact that in today's debates, it is medicine that is the, at the forefront of what might be considered the resurgence in force of scientific race theories. And it would be well, therefore, for those working in biomedical fields today if more attention were paid to this long history. Um, I'm done, but uh, we'll end on the plug, right? <laughs> I'll just leave that up. Yeah. Actually, I promise I won't. I'll get us back to where we